Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash cultural stew. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Cultural Stew Podcast, coming to you from the Goat Factory Media Entertainment Studios. We are your cultural media recommendation podcast, giving you our take on what we think is worth carving your time out for, and also what we think you can pass on and maybe go cut that lawn instead. Warning, we use adult language, and there may be spoilers ahead. Hello and welcome to the Cultural Stew Podcast, episode number 12 for the week of May 12th, 2018. That's convenient. The 12 and 12. 12 and 12. The day before Mother's Day. My name is Ron Herkins Jr. I am the (laughs) co-host. My name is Ron Herkins Jr. and I am here with my co-hosts. Tony Carter. (laughs) Valerie Edmar. A mother. Happy Mother's Day. A mother. I am definitely not a mother. (laughs) Uh, how you guys doing? I'm all right. I'm a little, I'm good. A little caffeinated, but good. A little caffeinated? Uh, yeah. Just a little? I got up and, uh, I was at Starbucks at 620. I get to see the people that are at Starbucks at 620. Do you know them at Starbucks? Like, do they know you by name yet? They do, um. which upsets my daughter. <laughs> Valerie's dad's here in the studio and he's shaking his head. Yes, yes they know. <laughs> Except my daughter. My daughter gets upset because she says, how do they know your name when I have been going to Bill Gray's since I was, you know, for years <laughs> wow. and I ordered the same thing and I walk in and they don't know my name and they don't know my order. Wow. I don't know what to say about that. That's rough. So you went to go fill up with caffeine. I went to go fill up with a run. This morning at six. Good for you. Five. You're probably so. tired. No, I'm actually. It, it's very energizing. So good for you. What did you do this morning? Wake up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we usually record in the afternoon, so for us to record in the morning, this is a rare opportunity. But we figured with the holiday and the things coming up, it was the best option that we had. So we are here. We are in the studio. We are recording. What did you do this weekend? Week. Uh, last couple weeks are you starting i can start um i went to see trevor noah actually he was in town yeah trevor from daily show was here and he did his stand-up oh. routine where was he at he was at the codec on the ridge okay so i have his book but i haven't read it yet you haven't i should read it so um i'll, I'll give that theater this credit that they're bringing in a lot of bigger yeah. name acts yes. lately and doing cool things like 70 mil projection over there. Every once in a while they do the 70 mil. I miss Dunkirk when they did that over there. Don't say so. That makes me hurt. I'm sorry. It was a good It was a good show. The crowd was kind of like mixed with older people and then, you know, young people and the younger people were loud and just riotous and I was sitting in the third row. So nice. I got all that behind my head, the screaming and shouting and people hitting me in the back and like, isn't he great? I'm like, I don't need you hitting me to say he's great. You can just use your words. Hitting you in the back? That whole like, hey, he's great. Isn't he slap? I'm like, Ah, are you not in a seat? I'm in a seat, but just people just uh, you like rub your shoulders. Somebody you don't know touching yes, you. Yes, it was awkward. Right. So I'm like, I don't know. I have never heard of that. <laughs> yeah, these people it was, are really excited. Yes, it was weird. And the thing is, we had a good time. But Grace and I watch his stand-up specials on Netflix, so we heard the jokes before. But it's great seeing his face in person, seeing how animated he can get, and he was. Yeah, and you get you get his response in person yeah. as like how he feeds off that energy and his timing. Well, we had people in the front row who were heckled kind of by his opening act, and then the two I call them brats. They were brats. Their father's a lawyer, and their mother is a nurse teacher. Hopefully, they don't listen to this podcast. But they're in the front row with their cell phones up, just recording. And we had been warned before: no recording the show. So they're with their cell phones, just recording him, and then the usher comes by really like a hawk, whoop. There's a couple interesting new things that are coming out um, that they're they're testing out, and one of them is in Jack White's. They're he's done this uh, now throughout all of his stuff for the show. Is actually you're, they're putting them in lock bags, and you cannot use your phone. You turn them in, and then you get it back after the end of the show. Or if you need to use it during the show, you have to go to the area, unlock it, and use it. That's what they do at Paisley so you, Park. Um, just not share. But I think you're just going to find more of that. Is people are just going to start doing that, and then. 
uh, who is it? Nine inch nail. Is it nine inch Correct. nails? They're not doing online ordering. They canceled all online ordering. You have to go if you want tickets to their shows. You have to go to wait in the box office like everybody else. Oh, true. really? I yep. want that man because they want to skip the um, online scalpers and bots that are confused taking over. Because you say they and is it the are they? Trent Reznor is Nine Inch Nails, and he hires a band, he hires a band to go with him on tour. Okay. Um, funny thing is, my friend Tom was working the Kevin Hart show, which was on Saturday night, the next day, and he said. Opening act alone, because Kevin Hart really can't have the flashes and stuff because of his eyes, like Bono and it's another uh, Ryan Adams, the same way. Opening act, not actually Kevin. They kicked out 70 people in the pit for before, before the show even started, before Kevin was on stage, and they kicked 70 people out of the... I'm like, was it worth it? I mean, you have pit seats and... I will say that Paul McCartney does not care, and I apologize if I've already repeated, like said this story. Do I have to tell you? No, I don't think you have. So when Paul McCartney seen it a few times but when he he always says i can always tell the ones that people really don't know he's like he said he he'll sing his hits right that everybody knows and then he'll sing the new stuff and he said man i can tell because all the phones go away all the lights go away he said but i mean he doesn't care i mean all at once all the lights are on everybody's got their phones on everybody's got their little pretend what are they called they're like Flash fake lights. lighters Flash that people can get on, on the phone. phone. And yeah. <laughs> so fake lighters and all this stuff. I think he digs it. I don't think he cares. He doesn't seem to mind. I posted in an entire Love and Let Die video on on YouTube. and I think there is something to be said of it because it's not only like the musician's interaction with the people that are on stage, but it it's also your enjoyment from an audience perspective. I go there to see them and if I'm – you know, 30 rows back. And all I see is people's phones. phones. But I don't see that. I, I When I went and saw Hans, I saw it. And I was only seven rows back. And it was annoying. Oh, in a movie. No. No. no they, at a concert. concert. Oh, Hans Zimmer. Okay, you gotta. I'm it's, thinking sorry. Han Solo, it's, dude. It's annoying and it's distracting yeah. that all I see is those. I don't. Well, the reason why Grace it. and I sit so close is because I have a crowd mentality mindset that when I'm in a crowd, it encourages you to laugh at something that may not be funny. So we're sitting in the front close enough. We laugh because we want to. We're not encouraged by the crowds. It's psychological, I know, yeah. but it's, I don't want that crowd reinforcement. I want to laugh because I know. I can see his face, and it's funny. <laughs> you don't want to laugh because there's a laugh track? Yeah, I want to laugh because I... Because you feel it. Yeah. I'm so, going to feel. You went out and saw Trevor Noah. Um, I went out and I photographed uh, photos for Jiva's opening of Steel Magnolias this week and followed that up with doing a video promo for filming Blackfire Theater's Avenue Q opening. That's cool. Um, we're kind of in the hotbed of like theater season right yes. here of everything opening. We got Bridges of Madison County opening up at JCC. When is that opening? That Bridges opened. opened last weekend. How long is it playing? Until one more weekend, one, right? I have <laughs> next week yeah, to go. Yeah. So and then Hamlet's opening up in a couple weeks. We got Hamlet opened. No, Hamlet night. opened up, but in a couple weeks we yeah. got uh, Marigaround opens up their first show. So crazy, I'm crazy. in hot season for me with like all the theaters that I'm involved with are opening up. So I've got I'm just jumping over, over getting photos and videos. But it's good, it's cool. though, isn't it? I it's like that. Great, great theater right now in the area, which is you know there's just I've this, never like, seen Abigail, little, Abigail, Abigail Q. It was funny. I enjoyed it. I know it sold out before they even opened. Adult so Sesame whole, Street. What's that? It's adult Sesame Street. I told yes. you. Exactly. Yes. Um, one of the things like Rick Lyons, um, when he came here and did the little special, he was mentioning when he designed the puppets. One of the puppets in there is, uh, her name's Lucy and she's a hooker and she's pink and she's got blonde hair. And he said on Sesame Street, one of the characters that he would often do was a little girl that was pink with blonde hair. And he always imagined that it was her grown up. That's fantastic. Yeah. It was just like perfect. Oh, that's. My God! So it was his own subtle little joke that he threw into Avenue Q after nice. all of his work with the gym. Poor Hansen. girl. And yeah. wakes, I mean, <laughs> she could have a pretty woman experience, though. Yeah. Mm, that movie. How about you, Valor? You've been up to this week. Okay, so I had friends in. Well, my little sister is my friend. My little. And uh, she's not even that little. So Mandy and then um, Dewey. my friend Dewey, who... People will get to know later. A great conversation with him. That was fun. He's awesome. Um, so they came up 
to stay and a listener of the on. show. So hi, Lou. Hi, Dewey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And um, so they came up just to have fun with me. So that was fun. So we just went out. Huh. I said, because I was just like, I just, I have to go sit in a movie theater because that's my, that's my feel good place. So we went to go see the Avengers. I said, how do you guys feel like seeing Infinity, Infinity Wars? Do you, how do you care? Do you care about seeing that? And they said, sure. I said, have you seen any of the movies? And he said, oh, like a couple maybe. Dewey said, uh, no. Yeah, Dewey didn't seem like he would be a person who'd be no, invested in the Marvel Universe. But he was totally saying, I'm totally for it. Let's go. Let's go see it. And so we went to go see it. Um, I can't remember. I think it was like mid-morning or something. Um, and there were people right behind us and I felt really bad because I found it amusing because it starts out and I lean over to Mandy and I said, I have no idea what's going on right now. Like, had no idea. Through the entire movie, pretty much had no idea what was going on. I had not seen. This is why you should do your homework because I fell asleep three times. I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. I did. I fell asleep three times. And I kept waking up. And then, you know, they would go get, you know, he would say, here's chocolate. Here's popcorn. Here's, you know, like, so I could sit up and watch. But I had, I had. A couple of people ask me, and I saw a couple of conversations. They're like, "Oh, what movies can you skip to go into this?" I'm like, "You can't skip you any can't of them." Be- and they're like, "Oh, yeah." And then like the relation, they were like, "Oh, yeah, sure, you can." I'm like, "No, every single movie has some sort of tie to this, and you need to have that full investment as to like understanding how each of these things thread together and why this is happening and why this person's here." And Dewey's favorite was um, the people from the T um Gal- Guardians? Yes. Thank you. Way to read my mind. Guardians of the Galaxy cuz they were funny. I wanted to see where she went with that. Yeah. Guardians, Guardians of the Galaxy. Um I didn't even that was Thor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't know it was Thor through most of the movie. Had you seen Thor Ragnarok? No. Grace why. loves okay. the yeah. Guardians. And see what, and people had like said, oh, you can skip Thor Ragnarok. No. Even though it's you funny, really can't you can skip, skip Spider-Man Homecoming. I'm like, you can't skip Spider-Man Homecoming because you missed the whole thread of he Tony and, and Peter's relationship as basically surrogate father-son relationship could here. Could there have been more death? It was just death. Well, that was the point, point. of it. Thanos has been the looming figure over Marvel since the first Avengers. Okay, I'm going to ask a question, and I, I know there's spoilers, so I don't care. You already spoiled, but go ahead. There's a disclaimer at the I beginning. I just said death. There's a disclaimer at the beginning. Go ahead. I didn't say who died. <laughs> okay, so we waited and waited Everybody and waited, dies. but I had to go to the bathroom so bad, and oh, they were dear. just sitting there like, okay, and um, was there a... Th- <laughs> I know. I didn't wait. We didn't wait. I had to go to the bathroom. Ask the question. So what was, was there something after the movie? Yes. yes. What was it? Can you tell me? No. Come on. There's a spoiler thing. I know, but that's one I'm going to leave. What, uh, I'm can not going to see it. Can I ask you? Yes, you will. Can I ask you a question? Which parts did you fall asleep? I don't know because I was asleep. Before? I mean, what, what was happening before you fell asleep? I don't remember. Okay. I was really Can we tired. take her to the theater and keep her eyes open so nah. mechanically and... I know that it sounds like I no, haven't. no. It, Look, I fell asleep during Baby Black, Driver. Well, that's it. I fell asleep. Dur- I here it is. It's like when I get into a comfortable spot, which is safe, and you know my little home for, away from home, and I have no children, and they're not asking something from me, and I'm in a recliner. It does not matter what time it is. I fall asleep at Jiva Ooh. all the time. Ooh. Maybe because I'm taking a drink beforehand. I'm. What I might have to do is when Infinity War comes out on disc is we'll just have to have like a Screen. multi-weekend party where we just go through where we start at the beginning and watch. Yeah, I'm sure Jason them. will. So, th- Grace will be thrilled. thrilled. No, not sarcastic. Grace would love that. So, But she's seen all of them. So. I don't think. I mean, Jason's going to have to be or going to have to get a babysitter. Because I think when, when did I start this Actually, year? We yeah. started Christmas weekend. And then through the week, so over two weeks, it, we went through all the movies and caught up again. Didn't you say there's 
basically if 19 you, this is the 19th movie yeah but if you count in all the tv shows well he, if you really want to dig into it but there's Did you very have to? no no okay. there's very like the the netflix tv series doesn't touch anything on it there's very little of the marvel's agents of shield outside of the first two seasons that kind of touches upon stuff in that happens in the universe but nothing is affected if that makes sense like, okay so it's more of like you know, you have a big comet and a little piece breaks off instead of everything coming together to form that comet. When it, when it was over, I looked over and I said, Ron has seen this two times. That's, have you seen it more than once now? Twice now? Did no, you see it just again? Saw it twice. Okay. So after the show. Um, if, if I could find it, if they had came here with IMAX 2D, I would have. I won't go see it in the IMAX 3D. I just, my eyes just don't IMAX handle it. IMAX 3D well. would be nice. I may, may have not have fallen asleep then. But um, so I. Spent, it's going to transfer over well to 4K, though. I spent over. Right after we left here, after um, Dewey's interview, which will air at some point in the future, um, when he was on Moments of Influence, mm-hmm. uh, we went to Record Archive and spent a good two hours plus there. And then we went to eat. I found. Um, the network on DVD. I added to my DVD collection. Yes, wow. I did. Um, That's the one with Robert Redford, right? No, no. network, which was on HBO, and at um, uh, Jeff Bridges, not Jeff, um, Jeff Daniels. Jeff Daniels. It's. Okay. Have you seen it? I've seen parts. Did you not like it? I, I thought loved, it was good. It was, I, I thought the first two seasons get into were, it. I loved, wanted to, just couldn't loved it. get into it. I loved it. Anyway, so, so good. Um, so I bought that and I bought, I may. Is that Sorkin's work or is that something yeah. I'm new? Okay. Yeah, That's why is. I think I was having Sorkin fatigue at that point. So. I bought two other ones and I can't even remember what they were. They'll come back to you. I've, yeah. Did you know that if you're, Grace went on Amazon and found out she wanted to buy me a birthday present and she was going to get me the, the whole Marvel collection, phase one through three. And she said, it's like $1,000 on Amazon getting every single Marvel. Uh, yeah. It's something you have to do over time. time or pick slowly. what you want. So, but yeah. Then, I've been hoping, I've been waiting on getting the backlog, <laughs> hoping that they start putting out some of those in 4K, but they weren't filmed in a format that transfers well to 4K. So, right. Up I was until, telling Dad about your 4K, but I can't explain what it is. Um, okay, it's a television. Yeah, it, but it's also it's a resolution. I mean, 4K is a resolution, right? So, well, right, right. You got 1080p, which is your standard HD that mostly everybody's TVs are in now. So, if you 4K would be four times the size of that. So, you double the lines up. You also get double the lines. Wide. So, how big is your television again? It's a sixty-five inch. Okay. So, but just imagine like a ten eighty p on size of that would only be a quarter of the screen size in resolution. That's amazing. I uh, so they left sadly, and then um, my parents came in. Obviously, dad is here in the studio, but I. We've just been doing odd jobs, so which they just kind of been following my lead, which is kind of <laughs> nice, which may have nothing to do with what I really need to be doing. But it's like, hey, can you, but, you know, not having to cook and not having to do my laundry. <sighs> That's really nice. So what is everyone looking at? Sorry, I'm, I'm updating something. So I'm trying to figure out what you the You don't even care about my weekend. We do care about your weekend. My, we just make sure we update. Okay, so I am... So finally uh, done with okay. my week. Okay. On that, we're going to skip into our shorter news segment today. So some of the news that's coming out, um, uh, some Broadway news. We got uh, Moulin Rouge, the musical, Aaron Tevitt and Karen Olivio. Uh, we got a little bit of a promo trailer for that as a surprise this week. I may have watched that about five times <laughs> and showed Zoe, and she hasn't seen the movie, but she was just kind of... Yeah, I'm I was kind of shocked. I, I think excited. you had started commenting on it before I even, like, I'm like, I didn't even 
get onto my sites and it was like already stuff from Valerie. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I, am really, I am very excited. I said, Jason, I hope you realize that Dustin is going to have to come up here and we're going to have to spend enormous amounts of money to go see this show on Broadway unless it doesn't. But I, I'm very, very excited. It's one that it's going to be interesting to see how it transfers over. But I mean, I'm I'm excited that they at least got two really amazing singers. And then, I mean, whoever else. I was happy the with background. the casting so far. I haven't seen her. Karen, you as soon as you see her, you'll right off the top of my head. I can't throw what else she was in, but you'll see her and you're like, oh, OK. Is she redheaded in it? I'm just curious. No. Oh, in terms of is she playing the, a redhead in? Yeah. Santini? I don't know. I haven't seen. I, I think okay. the redhead was just because it was Nicole Kidman. I know. I was just curious. I'm just having a little apprehension. I mean, I was excited about the Ami Lee musical, and then it bombed. And I was so disappointed. So I'm going to hold my breath and wait until I see more footage. But at the moment... The first song was pretty good. Yeah, but so was the but Ami come, one, too. Come What May is one of those ones that I think can easily translate into a theater show. Ami right. is you're taking a movie and adding... Musical. Music to it, and that whereas me. come what or not come what? Well, I really was already a musical to begin with. Yeah, but are they going to do where they have the people sitting in the theater? Are they going to have him coming, up, like coming down the aisle? She starts singing. He turns around in the aisle and starts walking up singing. I'd be all for a cabaret experience, but I don't know. What I mean, do. how could you not do it that way? One of the shows that I wanted to see that really like they completely gutted the theater and redid the theater was uh natasha and pierre's uh, comment of 1812 mm. they completely redid the theater oh, wow. to make the audience part of it they actually had a state they had seating in the middle and then they had a stage that basically went around the people that were sitting in the middle and then they had um a dome no <laughs> cool. uh seating up near the orchestra and so you could sit in there next to the orchestra members and then they had some normal seating behind but it was an all enveloping experience but sadly it was one of those like they made some casting decisions with mandy patankin that kind of shot themselves in the foot and all of a sudden the show was done so what do you mean uh we'll go into it offline okay fine it was because uh, i love mandy patankin oh it was just somebody was in the role and then they announced something with mandy patankin and then oh. mandy patankin was like uh i didn't know i was taking the role from this guy and it just because uh, okay. so was... they were going for sales over quality quality and i just still think that if i was in charge i would do i would have it be a whole thing so that the theater i mean so because when you're watching the movie moulin rouge you're in it and he's i mean when he turns around and he starts singing i was showing zoe the show her the whole movie don't show parts i show can't the show her the whole movie yes, you can no i can't how old is she She's eight. Uh, she's no, fine. she's not Come ready. On. She's not ready. What is there not to be ready for? A lot. Like what? There's a lot there she's not ready for. Uh, All right, moving on. Um, so, so maybe, maybe you know, nine. <laughs> a year. Okay. Uh, Tease. Okay. So another uh, trailer that came out, uh, the new Robin Hood trailer finally breathed its life into the world. With. How many Robin Hoods are we going to have here? <laughs> I don't know. This one looks a little bit different. It's got Taron Edgerton um, and Jamie uh, Foxx Jamie Fox and Jamie Dornan in it. Um, it looks interesting. It's got a, Is this a, a drama bit. or a comedy? Drama. Drama. Action drama. Is there going to be some major... I think Song. it's pretty straightforward. No. no, I think it's pretty straightforward. Being, no, no, this is <laughs> dude. When that movie came, when the original Robin with, Hood, Prince of Thieves, was a product of its time. Yes. I know. In that movie, that's the song. Give me the song by Everything You Do by Brian Adams. Yeah, dude, I listened to that. Who hasn't? But over and over and over. From that movie, it also gave me one of my favorite pieces of score music by Michael Kamen right. at the beginning. It's the one that everybody knows. Yeah, trailer fodder. Well, no, it's the it's the opening for a bunch of Disney movies, a, bu a bunch of Fox movies. It's like the opening. Dun 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 yeah. dun 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 dun. Love. It's like it's, one of my favorite pieces. I will listen to it over and over and over. 
And that came from the same movie that has Kevin Costner as Robin Hood, Morgan Freeman in one of his better roles. My as, older sister and you need but, to have a really long talk about soundtracks and scores. So that one, I don't know. I'll go and see it. Cool. I was excited when the Robin Hood was came out a couple of years ago with Russell Crowe in it, but it just it didn't out? do well. That totally was a, sometime this year. I don't have the mess. date. I'm sorry. That felt Everything bad. on it said it should have been good. I know. I mean, the Russell original Crow, script was, Ridley Scott. They kept changing the script. I mean, I re- at the beginning, it was supposed to be good. It was supposed to be a Robin Begins, and it became a whole just... Who yeah. wrote the Sense8 destination? The Wachowski brothers, who are now the Wachowski sisters. I met sisters. who wrote it on here. I did. And they're canceled. I, no. Let me... Uh, so Sense8 was, had two seasons. I remember. And then got canceled. And then there was a huge like, oh, no, why did this get canceled? We know we never got a, a, like a resolution to this. And then they came out a couple of months later, a couple of months, a month later, and said, hey, we're going to do a two-hour uh, finale to wrap up everything. And so they just, uh, Netflix kind of teased it on Twitter Did beginning of it? the week. They just said patience. And then all of a sudden there was a trailer out like the next day. And so it's coming out on June 8th, the, the finale. So that'll like be my so-called life. Sense eight. No, what I'm saying is the fact that it was not even to- close. <laughs> what I'm saying is there was an uproar. And they switched it over and they... I think this was an uproar because this this was... This gave a very huge uh, portion of our population. Um, you know, the LG... The LG, presentation. Um, I'm going to say it wrong. LGBQQT. Um, a very strong representation. And when you take one of these out of the film market... And it was also strong because, the you know, both of the, the Wachowski... Saying their names wrong, so the Rakowski, Wakowski. There you go. They're the, um, they were the behind the Matrix. Both of them have uh, become transgender or trans uh, transition transitioned. Um, so now they're both female. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes. And so that was another thing. It was like, okay, you have something led by two awesome. uh, transgender. You have a show that is, you know, all about inclusiveness and you know. It was very original and unique, and I was invested in it. And it was like, oh, and it just like was leading up, leading up, and leading up, and led you up to the cliff, and absolutely no resolution to anything. So it was like, ugh, really, Netflix, you've stuck around with other stuff that you've kept on for longer, but yeah, at least they're they're coming around and they're going to finish it up and give everybody Good. resolution for it. So, Cobra Kai came out a couple of weeks ago. Wax on. Off. That's the <gasps> yeah yeah. Um, I'll get into that later because I'm talking about that as my viewing. That was project. a YouTube movie. YouTube, YouTube Red. series, Red. Yeah, uh, right. And other news. Thanks to Roseanne, Tim Allen's coming back to TV. Yeah. Last Man Standing is returning this time on Fox. So, I guess they're seeing a need to bring him back, and I guess Fox bought. Into it. Okay. This is this is the week for things to get renewed on different networks, right? Um, Brooklyn Nine Nine. I saw that got canceled. Canceled. Got canceled on Fox. Netflix passed on it. Hulu passed on it. NBC just picked it up. So they're so they going to have. They're going to have another. Yeah, I just like, but I never watched it. Brooklyn Nine Nine. It's funny. We things have to be really funny. It's funny. It, it's a funny enough. We, funny enough <laughs> in terms of what's on tv yeah yeah okay but if they swapped it we don't have less standing let's do this i generally like save enough comedy shows for like a n- one night a week of stuff we could just watch all the comedy stuff on one night just to have a night of levity off of all the rest of the stuff that we watch i just i i have a hard time i there are things that people think are funny and i don't think are funny at all what do you find funny um, but they're mostly movies, but I mean the shows, um, well, the pre, I haven't watched, sorry, Dustin, the new Will and Grace, but the old Will okay. and Grace I see. always made me laugh. I always laughed. Um, and I've never had an interest in that. My wife loves the show. I, it's very funny. So. And, and I says like, you, oh my God. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> says a lot of people, but anyway, um, 
but there are there are movies that always make me laugh, like um, oh, the play about the play behind the, the noises movie, off. Uh, Christopher Reeve. There's, there's noises off. Yeah. Noises off. You said mm-hmm. that right off the bat, didn't you? I have. Yeah. Yeah. So, so noises off always always makes me laugh. Airplane always makes me laugh because I laughed when I was a kid. Mm. Maybe you should not have been watching it when I was a kid, but I thought it was very funny. I did. Most of my comedy, um, what things I found funny come back from British humor. I am a very dark comedy British humor (laughs) person, and it comes from when I came home from school when I was young, flip on Comedy Central, and it would be Whose Line Is It Anyway? And so I'd be watching Whose Line Is It Anyway for... That's funny. You know, five, six years. But those are very bright people, and they're very funny. I mean, I also like... Uh, but it followers. led me into following a lot more of the British comedy. Best in Show makes me mm-hmm. laugh a lot. The Christopher Guest, Guest, Guest stuff is really good. Clue, we just watched. My little sister just watched it for the first time. How old is she? She's two years younger than I am. Okay. So she's 41. Whoa. We just watched it for the first time. I felt bad for her because Dewey and I were just laughing preemptively. And uh, I don't know if she even thought, it, I think she thought it was funny. I never asked her. That was another we were one laughing. that was on MTV or not MTV, Comedy Central forever. I just think that's really funny. But um, I don't know. I don't find, oh shoot, the one everybody loves about the nerds. Revenge of the Nerds? No, she's talking about Big Bang Theory. Thank you. Oh, that's not funny anymore. Uh, Wendy. It has its moments. My older sister I laughs every time. I sit there. If you if you gave up on it a long time ago and you don't watch every episode, there are it has its moments. <sighs> See, I know this. I get perfect. the humor. I get the humor. I always do, but it's just I started getting bored. It's got kind of repetitive it was for me. Repetitive. Yeah. And boring. Well, that's comedy. True. I don't know. When you have something that's a sitcom on TV for a long time, there is lots of repetition. Roseanne is just regurgitating crap. That I don't it watch was. that. I watch the old stuff. I watch Golden Girls like every night, at least one oh episode. Oh my gosh, Justin watches the Golden Girls. It's and he funny. just, he, that's his favorite show. It does make me laugh too. There's stuff. It's also Deadpool's favorite show. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that. But we watched the, we saw the, we saw the um, trailer and it looks Insane it for the, the insane. second one. Yeah, it's should, just insane. Like I yeah. kept thinking, how many movies are they squishing into this movie? The great thing about Josh like, Brolin, the De- what in the hell is going on there? Well, the great thing about the Deadpool series is, um, in the comics, he his biggest thing is he always breaks the fourth the wall. fourth wall. So he's always talking to you as the reader, and you're always having a, basically a conversation with him. And it was like, how are they going to translate that into the movie? And they did it so well in the first movie of him constantly breaking the fourth wall and just like talking to you directly that really has to work and ryan makes it oh it did it worked perfectly and ryan i like the ryan reynolds approach to it was the perfect way of doing it and that's why deadpool 2 i think is just going to be they've already established it so they don't have to like they they can just do whatever they want it's still going to be i'm sorry my my brain works but like it didn't work with sex and city the no uh, the first season awful i don't even own that but she keeps breaking the fourth wall and drives me nuts and then, um, where's the one? Doesn't she break the fourth wall on Clueless? Doesn't she talk to us? Uh, no. You mean, wait, you mean the TV show or the movie? Okay, what am I thinking of? I guess she, I guess she didn't. And the TV show she did a couple times and they stopped it, so. Um, there are some things that do, you know, like Our Town, the yeah. play, breaks the fourth wall. When it works, it works, and when it doesn't, it doesn't. And sometimes it doesn't work. I think it's sometimes self-indulgence when they do it. And it's from a writing standpoint, when people do it to explain things or give you exposition in an unnecessary way, I have a problem with it. But so, I think with Deadpool, it works. it's his character. It's always been his character. So he's it's not doing something that's unconventional. It's something that he's always done. It's always been established for him as a character in the comics. So people were expecting like how the heck it was going to work. And I love his, like, in the Deadpool true trailer, his uh, tongue in jokes to Josh Brolin of making fun of him for Goonies and then making fun of him for being Thanos. All in, like. Did you see him stick his middle finger up, the, the Infinity Gauntlet middle finger? You didn't notice that? He, in what? In uh, 
Oh, sorry. In Infinity War? Yeah. There's no. a middle finger jab that he did in the movie. Mm. How did he link you to it? Did you like the way they did it in House of Cards? Kevin Spacey talking. I think it was effective. I yeah. thought it worked. Well, they did it in and the, the original. the British one, too. The British one, they did it. It was um, Whatever the last season was, it was used a lot less. It and was. And then all of a sudden, it was like one or two episodes towards the end, he just... Starts talking. Starts talking back like, oh, you You're, thought I forgot about yeah. you. It was like, oh. Kidoki, this is creepy. <laughs> oh, anyways, uh, any any more news? Yeah, uh, our short news segment <laughs> went on. We're a half an hour into this show. Los Santo <laughs> people. Maybe I think I'm good. Gotten rolling. So, okay. You good? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna roll right into our recommendation list, and Valerie, you're gonna kick that off. I am, which is kind of funny because my show that I watched was Here and Now <laughs> on HBO. And it got canceled, but that's okay. After one season, I really enjoyed it. It has Holly Hunter and Tim Robbins. And the plot it kind of involves many issues around. They have like a multicultural family because they decided to adopt um, from a lot of different countries. And then they have one daughter that they uh, had naturally. What do you want to call that? is their biological daughter and um, one of the one of their children these are all grown children by the way starts seeing things that no one else can see and so it kind of starts revolving around what the heck is going on with him um, but the creator I mean the creator was from which was Alan Ball that six feet under an American beauty okay hmm. these are things that I enjoyed greatly, and I really liked the show. But and Holly Hunter, who was excellent, also in um, one of the I movies just, just we, one of the movies we just watched. Yes, but she was also in um, the big sick, the big squid, squid and the whale. Well, the squid and the whale, but she was also in uh, Top of the Lake first season. Um, she was fantastic in that, um, but. So that was kind of a bummer. I just actually found that out this morning. I'm like, I'm going to review this. This is going to be great. Really enjoyed it. So you know what, people? I don't care if it was canceled. Watch it. It's fun. I mean, it's interesting. It moves along and it's... There's it's, lots of shows that were canceled after one year that were great. Yeah. but And then there was shows that kept on going that sucked. Shouldn't have. But that's okay. Anyway, watch money, it. Money, 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 money. So you can watch it probably soon on something else. <laughs> but uh, If it's an HBO show, it'll probably stay on HBO for a while. They're pretty I only have HBO because I, I got it through something and you pay like an extra little mm-hmm. dividend or whatever. And so you, that's what I have. HBO has some keepers on there. Yeah. So that's what I watched and what I recommend. Oh, I uh, I caught Kodachrome on Netflix. Um, Kodachrome was a movie that was just released at the Toronto Film Festival back in September and bought up by Netflix and received its release uh, mid-April. Um, stars Ed Harris, Jason Sudeikis, Dennis Haysbert, uh, Elizabeth Olsen, Bruce Greenwood, and a f- another female that I forgot the name um, kind of play the main characters in there. Um, basically, uh, it's directed by Mark Raso. It's based on a New York Times article. Uh, it came out in 2010 that revolved around the dissolution of all the Kodachrome chemicals. So Kodachrome can't be developed or processed anymore. So there was this one place called Dwayne Fo- Dwayne's Photo in Kansas. Um, that was He's the last place in Kansas because we got two Kansas people. Here. Yeah. Um, it was the last place, um, on earth that you could actually physically get a coat of crown film developed. So in the last months, they just had people coming in from all over the world. They had a, a train guy come in and get like 15,000 slides or $15,000 worth of slides developed and processed why they still had the chemicals before they ran out. And so they took this idea of this place closing and you have Ed Harris um, 
plays a oh, we start with Jason Sedeckis. Jason Sedeckis starts off. He's a, a record exec who um, is trying to sign his uh, one of his bands and they turn him down. He's on the verge of getting fired. And his boss basically says, you have two weeks to get these other people. If you don't sign them, you're done. And, you, and in the process of that, he walks back to his office and there's Elizabeth Olsen. Yay. Who he has no clue who she is. And he's like, well, why are you here? And she's telling him about this uh, man named Ben who is dying. And Jason Sudeikis is just buried. He just doesn't care. He's like, I don't care. And then why would we care? Because Ben is his father. So Sorry about we that. learned that Ben, spoiler. Um, <laughs> played by Ed Harris, is dying of liver cancer. And there was, he was basically an ass, um, jackass to his son and everybody else, cheated on his wife, slept with every woman that was out there. And is Ed Harris? It's Ed Harris. It's a joke. Um, right. And. But Ed Harris plays a world-renowned photographer who oh, cool. photographed a lot of stuff for National Geographic. And one of the things that he wants to do is he heard about the Kodachrome place uh, closing and being the last place to develop. And he knows the guy personally because that's all his father ever shot on was Kodachrome. And his father wants to drive from New York to Kansas and he wants his son to come with him. I'm totally watching this. And so... After a lot of back and forth, you know, we have Ed and father, Ed and um, Ben, Matt, Matt, Matt is Jason Sudeikis and Ben is Ed Harris, um, finally meet and it's like contentious right from the beginning. Um, and you just find out what, what level of asshole Ed Harris is and was to his father to the point where Jason Sudeikis went and lived with his uncle and aunt for pretty much his entire youth. Um, growing up after a couple weird things where Dennis Haysbert, who plays a helper of Ed Harris's character, arranges a meeting for Matt's character to meet with the band that will basically save Matt's career. That means they have to stop in Chicago. He agrees to go. And so in the process of this little road trip, um, you know, you have the, the, ever close to dying Ed Harris becoming more of an ass, but also breaking out of trying to make up for, does he look ill? Oh, he looks the most sickly I've ever seen Ed Harris. It's mm -hmm. kind of, it was kind of like jarring because I, you know, That's Westworld true. is on right now and Ed Harris is in that. And it was just like clicking the back of my head. Like you don't realize how old he looks like he's getting. Um, and Elizabeth Olsen plays the nurse, so she comes along. And so oh. in a convoluted thing of events, Elizabeth Olsen and Matt eventually sort of hook up. <laughs> it works in the context of okay. the story because they've both had disaster of relationships. And Ed Harris is the Ed Harris is the jerk in the background, like commenting on everything, laying it all out. He's like, Ah, you've been nothing and you know, looking at Elizabeth and telling her how bad of a person she was and you know how she's just loose meat and how she's not in jason sudeikis's thing but jason you know just this weird conversation in the car but as it gets on it gets on it's get on and jason finally kind of breaks and at harris's character breaks and they realize you know this is the last time he's gonna see his father and the reality of the don't cancer give, and the death don't give it don't give it away at the end this is a spoiler zone. Oh, dude. I know, he dies. I'm watch Everybody it. dies. What? He was, he was diagnosed with liver cancer with care. like less than a couple months my to live. Oh, my God. I just wrote it down on my to watch list. <laughs> Ugh. Okay. That's why they were doing this trip so he can get it done before he dies. It's okay. Kind of fine, 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 fine. So he. Yeah. Um, is, this is, is this is movie this movie or, is. I'm okay, going movie. to give it a. Yeah, it's on Netflix. Well, I know I didn't know if it was a series, series or Netflix or a no. movie. I'm sorry. No, it was a movie that premiered at Toronto Film Festival. Cool. And then, um, for me, the movie as a whole, I watched it because of my interest as a photographer. Don't watch it for that. <laughs> okay. Um, 
If you like family drama, watch it for that. But awesome. save it for a rainy day. Save it for a rainy day. It's not one I'm going to say. Hey, this movie is great. Did you watch it? Did you think Valerie medi- is going to love this? I don't know. It's mediocre. Oh. The saving grace of it is the callback to a couple really good classic '90s songs. One by Eddie Vedder and one by Live. One by Simon and Garfunkel. No, that is not in Just this movie. Just checking. They say it. They say the the lyrics. Okay. But I love Ed Harris and I love Elizabeth Olsen. So um Jason Sedeckis pulls his own as a more serious tone. Mm-hmm. Uh the best role is definitely Ed Harris. But oh, of course. You know. Okay. You just hate him it and then you're like, well. Hmm. But yeah. Is it hard to hate him or no? Is it hard to hate him? No, it's very easy to hate okay. him. Especially after the first couple scenes, you're just like, I, I see where he gets it from. But then you realize that Jason Sudeik has, has a little bit of stuff under the seams that need to be Did we talk with. about Ed Harris's past, like his parents or like why he's this way? Just speaking as it's because like he's a he's a creative photographer who's devoted his life to being so a he's photographer. narcissistic. Yeah, but it, it there is a speech that Ed has th- four fifths of the way through the movie that is actually worth listening to because it plays for what happens at the end, um, okay. and it fits. And there's it's, it's something that why he's as, like this. He doesn't even talk about why he's like this. No, like, you know he does. I said that he. It'd be because he's a creative photographer in the vein of how Picasso was a creative okay, person fine. and, you know, all these people that are insanely devoted to being creative Pollock. are end up being assholes. They mm. push everybody else away from you them. See what I did there? What Ed played? Did Pollock. you see that? Okay. Yeah. But they push everybody else away from them. <laughs> Got it. And uh but the part that touched upon me is he talks about, you know, where the photographers are preservationists and take photos of stuff so that his so down the line, history can see I, what a moment was like. And it's a really good little speech right before he kicks the bucket. Well, that's really <laughs> endearing. That's a yeah, nice way so, to end that. So, yeah, save it for a rainy day if you have nothing else to do. Don't rush to see it. Um, it's going to be on Netflix for a long time. So Obvious. if you have a long queue, put it on there. Mm. Yeah. Mm, I'll probably watch it. Okay. Anthony. So. Drum roll. I was watching uh, the first two episodes of Cobra. Uh, sorry, Cobra Kai. There it's the flash forward thirty four years later of the rivalry between Johnny Russo, Johnny Lawrence, and Daniel and Karate Russo Kid. and Karate Kid on YouTube. Red. Um, the first two episodes are available free, which is a good thing because I wouldn't pay to keep watching it. Um, my wife and I watched it the other day, last night, and. Um, in case you're not wondering, Daniel came to California 34 years ago with his mom from Jersey and tried to make it for himself and was bullied by Johnny's character. Cobra Kai was Johnny's karate school. Mr. Miyagi was Daniel's teacher. And long story short, Daniel kicked Johnny in the head and won the All Valley Karate Tournament. At the end of the- also learning how to take care of bonsai of- plants. Well, bonsai plants and cars and how to sand nice West. things and there, how to do There's uh, an offshoot that I'm going to tap into here before you continue with your Cobra Kai. Just going off of Karate Kid and how Karate Kid kicked off a generation of people of thinking that underdogs should always win. Correct. Instead of the people that actually put in the time and the effort and expertise in their craft. Right. And <laughs> like saying Mr. people Miyagi that skipping it. hard work that it just completely like, and that was just, the, it was a really good conversation. I was like, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. Did you, know? you see him rubbing his shoulders when it was sanding? No, no, no. He's talking about actually I'm, the, I'm a martial artist. I so. am trying to be funny and oh. no one's getting it. That's okay. No, I, I just, I was approaching it from the debate Got aspect it. of like, you have somebody that was a character that had spent basically perfecting his art since he was probably six years right. old and putting in all that hard work. But he's a And here comes... Mm, and he beats up on people. That's debatable. It's depend on how you look yeah, at it. Yeah. It it's really you interesting. You don't think that you, chasing somebody down and beating no, them up. No, before that, there's a whole yeah. culture of us who think that Daniel's the bully and Johnny was just trying to There's some But it was just interesting conversation that they said that this movie was the kickoff of people like 
yeah, you can slack off and you can be the underdog and the undertrained and then all take on these people that are the best of the best of the best. You can know? you give another example? Um, <sighs> Part of some of Rockies were that way. Yes. Some of the Rockies. Okay. You know? I think Rocky, Rocky only. The, the, uh, I think they bring up Clover Lane as one of their prime mm-hmm. examples where, you know, there's no way that Rocky would have been able to beat yeah. Clover Lane. And he didn't first. But anyways, back yeah, to your so, Cobra Kai. <laughs> I just I found it an interesting, timely conversation. It's just a weird thing. I mean, we're watching it, and there's so many flashbacks, which is nice throwbacks to us who grew up watching. Flashbacks right? from the actual movies? Yeah. Okay. And it's like sharp and crisp, like they remastered it in 4K, which is great. But it's just, I couldn't, I mean, I knew where it was going, and I'm like, okay, so we're going to reverse. It's nice taking the point of view of the antagonist and making him the protagonist. And then... Did just, you like him? Just didn't, could, I, I just I'm was, talking uh, about um, the Johnny Johnny character. You're talking about Johnny. Um, William. Z- 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 I Z- don't Z- know his name. Yeah, but Johnny. But Johnny. I mean, I felt bad for him. I mean, he's had a rough go. I mean, he's pretty much an alcoholic throughout the whole because series. he got kicked in the head. No, because his life went downhill after that incident. I know that. Yeah, well, so, it's like you you look. Can back we rebuild at, after that? You look at you back get kicked at, in the head with one tournament. You can look, you just and bounce back? Tried to kill you him. look back at Karate Kid and you wonder like. You know, we never got really tapped into his life. Like, right. what if his, like, you know, his mother and father were going through a divorce at that time, right. and he just made a mistake. Right. Or maybe his did father was stupid. abusive. Or, his father was, actually. They unraveled yeah. that. And just a lot of stuff going on, and just it was so one-sided and watching The Karate Kid in the 80s. You're like, uh, something else is going on with Johnny. Why he's so clingy to Allie? And Danny comes in and says, no, this is my woman now. I'm flirting with her with my eyes and during a beach thing, and it's just... So weird. It's just a weird thing. And then watching the one thing that totally upset me. There's a flashback in the second episode where Daniel's character is all like, well, there's several things, but he's being all like, I'm Japanese and Japanese American, and he's really not. But he's doing all this Asian influence stuff, and that's cute, great. But then he's doing karate with his daughter and a dojo in his house, and then he has a black belt on, and his daughter has a white belt, and I'm like, that right there took me out of it. Two episodes in, I'm like. Miyagi insisted there were no belts. There were no need for belts. And right. he's in his own personal dojo with a black belt on in front of his daughter wearing a white belt. That was a miss. And it's like, whoa. So basically, Danny let success go to his head. Right. That's yeah. too bad. I as also I, got as the I ca- said when I saw the trailer, I had no interest in seeing He this. shouldn't it have got the car bad. and the girl and the whole trophy. Well, and that's why it goes back mm-hmm. to the, the whole culture of underdogs getting everything. I mean, he got the car. It's just, yeah. It just, it just gives him the car. Yeah. yeah, it's unbelievable. It's just too, and he didn't even end up with the alley at the end. Then his daughter is like after this one guy who's beating up on. It's just too much. He falls in love with that other chick in the second one. Yeah, and then she's then he has a he wants to, then he comes back to America and wants to be with this other photographer slash pottery woman who's let's just be friends. And he's like, okay, let's be friends. But then I get up. It's just a mess. I only watched the first one. The other two are the second one's okay. Okay, so we are saying skip it. Skip it. Don't pay for YouTube Red. Do not. Just watch the first two episodes and then leave it alone. I mean, do we need to watch the two first two episodes? Well, episode one is from Johnny's point of view, which gives you a heart. You're like, wow, I get where he's coming from. I see why he wants to do. And Cobra Kai is not even about revenge, which is what they make it sound like. It's about him supporting his family and his life. He's broke. To be devil's advocate. Yeah. Okay. Listen. Do we have to have Johnny be beaten down, and then he turns to drugs. I mean, that's a really horrible... It's an 80s trope. I know, but we're talking about now. I mean, the guy is a total wash-up. It's like 34 years later, he's still doing the same... I mean, he's Pull. in his apartment drinking, and that's the one... He should have, like, liver disease or something. It's, like, heartbreaking. Like, you've been drinking this whole time? Like, this... You, he must have been. He's like a functioning alcoholic to the point where it scares me. Okay, well... It scares me. Let's turn our life around. Maybe... Can we... Does he turn... We don't he even does. know. Well, I think he does. Does he stop drinking and turn his life I believe around? he does. It okay, just, well, that's good. I have yet to see anything in promos for YouTube Red that has made me want to subscribe to Jason YouTube Rice, Red. Jason YouTube Red. Red. I should watch the first two episodes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. So, but I'm not going to watch anymore. And on that bombshell, we're going to take a break, and we will be right back. <laughs> For you, the listeners of the Cultural Stew Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to 
to check out their service. I have been a Audible uh, membership subscription person for a little while now, and I have enjoyed the books. I know Valerie is a junkie. Okay, a junkie. She is our expert on Audible. Okay, what are you recommending this week? Right now, I'm listening to. I'm finishing up. I'm listening. I I always listen to two or three at a time. But I'm finishing up the Alice Network, which I, I spoke about last week, and the secret she, the secrets she keeps by Michael Robothon, the Robothon, um, which I'm still. It's it's kind of a mystery, and the way they are putting it together is very. You're not going to figure out what's going on until the end. Um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about were the channels that they had, and so one of them which is what you get um, when you are a subscriber. You have these channels that you can just go on to. One of them is better than the movie. So you get all these books. You can listen to them for free. So right now they have The Prestige, uh, The Zookeeper's Wife, Slumdog, Jaws, The Descendants. Um, and then there's another one, which I think is kind of fun, is Follow the Clues. And they have a whole bunch, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Maybe, maybe That's maybe a little geeky for you guys, but I... Totally enjoy it. And then um, the 100-year-old man who climbed out the window. And does you guys know this book at all? I don't. But if if they're interested in checking out any of these, how do they go about? They go, they go to... This is written wrong. But it is audio... Audible. audible sorry. It's trial. audibletrial.com slash cultural stew. And one day I will figure this out. <laughs> But again, it's audibletrial.com slash cultural stew. And what do they get if they go there? They get a 30-day trial and a free book. One free. Well, it's a credit. And and even if you don't continue to be an audible person, you get to keep that book. So you do. I mean you, you can, can listen to it forever. You can you can use that credit on John Adams uh um audiobook. I forgot uh, I think it's Richard McCullough's John Adams. You can Huge use it on 36 hours of Audible. You can use it on any of the Harry Potter books that cost about 36 bucks on there. Yeah. I mean, it's you, you can worth it. keep an eye on and there's some really good deals that you can sneak in there with just that one credit. And then the daily deal. Don't forget the daily deal. Mm-hmm. And there are plenty of new releases coming in and out of there constantly. And they have their own their own shows. I mean, they have their own books. They bring in all these people, famous people, and they redo books, um, kind of like plays. It's really cool. So once again, 30 day free trial, one credit, go to audibletrial.com slash cultural stew and get your free audio book today. And welcome back. Today's stew is brought to you by Anthony Carter. Hey there. So, I've been thinking a lot about gimmicks lately, and if they work or they don't work. And, you know, sometimes us filmmakers add things to the cinematic experience that makes it pop more, makes it more enjoyable, in quotation marks. Also brings in money. Money. So, we have cash grabs, or we have novelty, and sometimes they wed into a really weird mix mess. Sometimes they're technology driven. Yes. Sometimes they are sensory. sensory they are driven. sensory. Some of them, especially toward the beginning. Some of them are marketing. So it's just whatever they want to do, whatever they can think about to get people in the seats. Because I'm telling you, you can even have a, you can throw branding in there too. Yes. Uh, Michael oh, Bay yeah. is uh, Michael Bay is a very huge branding gimmick guy. I think yeah. you can probably get about 20, 25 different brands prominently displayed in any of his movies. I mean, Reese's Pieces. Well, that Reese's Pieces were not a uh, popular thing. No. Cheerios, Superman, the original. So these little things, big things, make us watch movies? Yes or no? We don't know, but we'll talk about some. Depends on what they are right. and what the draw is. But this, I mean, this started... A long... Well, The Jazz Singer was 1927. That was the first talkie. And they right. were advertising it as, this is the first time you'll hear sound right. in the movie. Not with the movie, but in the movie. Yeah. And I know Chaplin was not a fan of talkies because he thought it was going to ruin his whole legacy and his 
And before that, all we had was Simon. words on a screen and Piano. an organist or a pianist playing. And so we didn't even have movie scores, right? If you want because to, they played whatever they felt, they like. felt like. And if you want to see how it can back, <laughs> it can ruin an actress career. You can, you know, watch Singing in the Rain because that's what that whole movie is about. Talkies and, and they realize that, uh, She's beautiful, but her voice is the most annoying thing in the entire world. So we bring in Debbie Reynolds. So, mm. yeah, just throwing that in. So Valerie has a little history to share with us. And, we'll and I'm going to take it away. Out. Okay, so I was researching this and uh, I actually kind of found it very interesting because some of the stuff that we talk about now, like spine tinglers, which I'll get to in a second, this is how it got brought about. That's how that saying happened, but... So we have a man named William Castle, who has been coined as the king of gimmicks. Um, he also was, he produced Rosemary's Baby, if that anybody needs like a. So in 1958, he um, did the movie Macabre. 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 Anyway. And each ticket that he sold was uh, included a $1,000 life insurance policy that you could sign in case it was too scary for you. <laughs> um, and he gave, um, Are you I, serious? No, if they should die of fright during the film. Wow. And he had stationed snake oil salesman. nurses in the lobbies with hearses parked out in the theaters. Um, and at least to say Macabre is a hit. What year? Um, 1958. Okay. And so, and then, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. Well, House on the Haunted Hill was also his, 1959. Um, and <laughs> he filmed Imergo, which he basically had a skeleton with red lights, uh, red light sockets that was attached to a floater wire, and it floated all over the audience. And he, that was sort of terrifying for children. And then the 1959. Cheap thrills. Yeah. There was a movie called Percepto, and it's, can you take Percepto? The Tingler, 1959. So the Tingler is very interesting because Castle purchased, like, military surplus airplane wing de-icers, which were vibrating motors, and he had a crew travel to the theater. Installed them. <laughs> and attach them to the underside of some of the seats. And then um, the so, buzzers were activated by Vincent Price, who was the star of the movie, when he warned the audience, scream, scream for your lives. And then these things would go off and people would scream. So it was the first 40X experience. Right. And so <laughs> that is why, that is where the electric things going off, that's where you get spine tingler. Huh. Okay, just thought I'd share that. I thought that was very interesting. He also had um, 13 Ghosts. Christ. So 13 Ghosts and um, the one I just said before, House on Haunted Hill, those were redone by his daughter. I think you guys probably, oh, you're not a horror movie man, but they were redone by his daughter later. Is that um, the Liam Neeson? Was he in that remake? The House on Haunted Hill that came out like in the 90s? Liam Neeson and... There's a lot of... People I remember it. I, I, it's not Lily. Lily Tomlin? Lily no, Lily Taylor. Taylor. Okay. No, Lily, whatever her name is. But Liam was in that, I think. He was? I think so. Goodness gracious. That was not a good movie. 13 Ghosts um, was filmed in Illusiono, which means this is actually really cool. And I wish they kind of would do this now. Okay, so each person was kind of, they were given these glasses. They were sort of, he was not in it, by the way. Um, that is not the movie I was thinking of. No. Anyway, they look like 3D glasses, except instead of being right next to each other, they were laid out horizontally. So you had red and blue horizontally. Okay. So the cool thing was that um, you could look through one lens and see one part of the movie. And then if you dared, 
You could look through the other one and you could see the ghosts if you wanted to. That's kind of cool. So during certain segments of the film, that they could see the ghosts if they look through the red cellophane or they could hide them by looking through the blue. I mean, that's that's kind of cool. I mean, I would I would probably go see that now. Uh, without the viewer, the ghosts were somewhat visible. And the DVD release, there was a DVD release? This is fantastic. There is always a DVD release. I know, but I didn't realize that they had one of um, this particular movie. So this is really cool. Anyway, um, they included the red and blue glasses, not 3D glasses. Um, but he simply, he, he's, he was kind of a nut. He had some movies that had a coward's corner. And if you decide that you couldn't take it and you got up out of your seat, he would shine this yellow light on you and make a huge deal out of it and watch the chicken, oh, watch shame. him shiver into the coward's corner. Yellow belly. He was um, Is that Back to the kind future? of a jackass. Yellow belly. But two of his films, I said, were remade by his daughter, Terry Ann Castle. She, she co-produced Haunt House on Haunted Hill in 1989 and yes. 13 Ghosts in 2001. Um, so, oh, and if you're interested in this man, there was a movie in 1993 called Matinee, and he is played by John, John Goodman. Okay. If you're interested in this type of, I, I'm kind of mm. excited about it. Okay. So, in that vein, let's do a quick recap of some history here. Um, we had Earthquake come out in 1974, which was that. the first since around, which used its sound, like deep bass, to make you feel something. Like, I know when I go to concerts and I'm hearing the bass, sometimes the bass waves hit me in a way and they affect you in that way, which also, a lot of hard of hearing people say the same thing, which when certain vibrations make them feel a certain way. So, if you know that technology, you can help hard of hearing people experience your music a little better. We move forward to polyester. Uh, 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 who wrote the score to Earthquake? You tell me. John Williams. Boom. You are so good. So I had to double check because I'm like, I'm pretty sure that was one of his big ones. <laughs> we had polyester come out in 1981, which was the odorama sensation. So you can smell things. They could smell polyester? You can smell whatever they want you to smell. But that didn't catch on either. No. So no one was on about I that. I can't imagine that. that. So then we go to... Can you imagine some of the smells in a movie? Would you really want to smell them? There were some theaters in the 1880s who would pump sewer sewage yeah. smells. Okay, moving I mean, on. I mean, moving when on. They, they, I mean, they've got the 40X now, but they're very, there's very few theaters out there, but they're still doing it today. Hmm. This next one you guys thought about last week, but let's move on. So next we have Who Framed Roger Rabbit? 1988, that's melding the family of live action and... Cartoons. Cell animation. Yes. They did it again in Cool World with Brad Pitt and... Right. What's her name? Um, she was in... Uh, Can't Terminator. Talk. Kim Basinger was in it. And... Um, did they call it? Not Terminator. Kim Basinger was not in Terminator. No. Not Kim Basinger. Kim sorry. Basinger was in Batman. Yes, that's what I mean. And we also have okay. Gabriel Byrne was in the film too, playing the artist. So Brad Pitt playing a cop. and But yeah, we're going to go. Oh, but yeah. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was the first time we took cell animation and Warner Brothers property and live hit. action. And it was good. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorites. I love it. So, And it's more so I love it for the cell animation. But Can somebody watch that one? Mm. It's, it's a little bit dark. Um, I mean, I know Jessica, cake. Jessica's got some stuff going Va-va-voom. on. Va Va Voom. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Then we go to 1995 with Toy Story with the first computer animated flick. So that was the first first time. Full length -length, feature. Sorry, correction. Full length animation. And they had a lot of almost near failures because the hard drives were missing and crashing, but they saved it. So because someone took a drive home and shouldn't have, but they did and saved the whole film. It turned out to be pretty popular. It was a good film for what it was. Then we had the Blair Witch come out in 1999, which is started the whole found footage phenomenon. Phenomenal. Did you guys thing. see that in the movie theater? No, mm-hmm. I skipped. It. I did. No, I, I did. I, I was saw. How it. old were you? I was let's see, 99. I was still getting. I was out of middle school, so I was like ninth grade. So about yeah. I was in college, years. and I went to go see it, and I was. I had to go see it with I Brian Hack. I was so Hack. disappointed. I didn't like horror thrillers. I wasn't. Ex- I didn't care for that. I'm like, I don't. The fact that she is freaking out so much that snot is pouring out of her nose. I mean, she is terrified. I mean, I felt like. 
I just wasn't into the found footage thing, and I still am not. It, it, it was person standing in this. In, in the, terms of marketing, it was one of the best marketed movies ever. I, I enjoyed it. I'm just gonna share. We'll have a thriller. They made a killing. So. Um, we have Avatar. <laughs> nice pun. Avatar came out in 2009, which was the first live. Well, sorry, now it was using motion, motion capture suits, so oh, to switch. capture motion of the actors while they were actually performing. Which helped the animators find points of reference for. It's just basically it wasn't the first, though. Well, not Gollum. the first, but they did Lord it well. of the Rings. This is two thousand nine. Yeah, but Lord of the Rings. I'm pretty sure Gollum was a full on motion capture suit. I'll research that, but I was um, full Avatar with the ping pong balls all over him. Did it well. Avatar basically, you know, Spark. the blue historic story of Pocahontas. And Fern Gully. But um, we'll um, get back to that. I'll research that some more. But I do know that this helps spark Bob Zemeckis' fascination with doing live capture, stuff like that. And he's been doing it ever since. I'm hoping he can rebound from that and do something else. I'm surprised you didn't use Titanic on here. For what? For just this type of thing. No, nah, it's not a gimmick. It's just a story that's told somewhat well. It was and gimmicky. Jimmy couldn't ruin it. So, um, uh, wait, hold on. <laughs> what would you find gimmicky in it? Just the fact that he uses this whole thing and then he comes up with this story of the blue and the, the, that's the MacGuffin. The MacGuffin is the blue diamond, but that's um. I don't know. I found it pretty pretty gimmicky. No, I'm still not seeing where it's gimmicky. I think it's just sell me on it. Sell me on it. I feel like taking this horrible tragedy and making it into this love story, where we are more worried about whether Jack slips off the ice than the. Hundreds of people that are dying. A little gimmicky. I would say I would classify it as gimmicky when they released the 3D version of it. That was a horrible. That was I so never bad. saw that. So bad. That was their. That was a couple Cat years ago. Cow. I would classify that as gimmicky. But I think, I mean, the history of cinema is taking events of history and making something out of it to make it entertainable and watchable. I did Ten Commandments. I watch that every Easter, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up watching the long four-hour version on TV. I don't know. So. For some reason, <laughs> it came across to me as like, okay. It's a cash grab. It's watching. I mean, did, okay, anyway, moving on. Okay, so then we had the Fast and Furious in 09 as well with the violent shoot. The seats were shake for you. Really? Yeah, like a ride at Universal Studios, which is where I think they got the idea from. I but didn't know that. Some theaters had seats that moved. That's cool. Yeah, oh, my gosh, Clue. Part of the 40 Vex, 40 X. Clue is gimmicky. Because they had three separate endings. We'll get to I'm that sorry. too. Clue did do that. Actually, they did it well. It's all marketing and also get people in the seats. And well, see, money. Clue, you can go on gimmicky for branding, for taking a game and making it into a movie, and for multiple endings. Have three different endings. You, you had to, to, to keep theater. going back and seeing it. Correct. Okay. And Boyhood took twelve years to make. That's the ultimate gimmick. That it I like. Won an Oscar for best actress. <laughs> twelve years. How long has it taken? The Man of La Mancha to come <laughs> <laughs> But it's not the that same thing. Cool. You don't use the same actors. It's not the same thing. No. It's show, It's telling an entire story of one boy. Um, I was going to put uh, Gravity on here, but I don't want to go into that. What is, why is Birdman? Because Birdman was shot to look like one long take, but it wasn't, which throws back to... Oh, um, very takes. good point. That's it good was point. Shot, it was basically a play re- filmed... And, right. And I it, loved Birdman. I did too. Okay. But it goes back to 1948 Rope, Hitchcock's film, which was the first to start that trend and whatnot. I so love long, sho- long shots are, are some of my favorite. Like my fa- One of my favorite long shots is from Touch of Evil. The opening scene yes. is like 10 seconds of uncontinuous, uncut. Do we have to even bring up the player? We had to watch the player a lot. And Boogie Nights did it well. In film school, we always, here's the player. Oh my God, we've seen this a thousand times. Okay, sorry. And Sean Baker did in 2015, he made the film Tangerine on iPhones, iPhone 5S. I do want to see Tangerine. It's a good movie. It's on Netflix, I think, or Prime. I'm not sure which, but um, I did see it. And Sean did the Florida Project with William Dafoe, which just came out for Oscar season, this past Oscar season. But Sean's doing a lot of things. He's trying new stories, trying to find different ways of telling them. Um, But yeah, so those are gimmicks. We sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But as a whole, they're all about getting our butts in the seats because some yeah. people think. And I, dying. I'd say, like, throw another one on there. It, gimmicky in the way of using a hardware technology to advance the story. Dunkirk. 
Yes. Film it on 70 millimeter. But it worked. And, you know, its best format, best viewing was in a 70 mil IMAX um, setting. Um, but that is a way that I think can be an effective use of a, a gimmick or a technological tool. Would you call a gimmick being something that would take something that's normal and make it terrifying? Mm. Can you give me an example? Well, <laughs> I was talking, we were talking about gimmicks. And so um, my dad said that he thought that Hitchcock was like the first person that was using gimmicks. And I, they actually had a lot of his stuff on some of the stuff that I was reading. Um, Psycho and all these things. But, but it, a lot of it was the, adver- the advertising. And um, the birds was... Well, you hidden. take Psycho. Um, Psycho set off a new generation of, of horror flicks. No, nothing came out prior to that that put Psycho in a completely different category. I mean, can you imagine watching... like? Our history of horror movies is based off of what happened in Psycho. You have this main lead character. She's on screen for 10, 15 minutes, and then she's killed in a very bloody, gory scene that up until that point, nobody had done anything like that. And if you go back and you read the things of people that have watched it, it was the scariest thing that they've ever seen in their life. Scared the bejeebers out of them. We never got that experience with that movie. I mean, John's because we too. were infected by like all these other movies that right. had branched off from it. Um, but yeah, I, I, you can use Alfred Hitchcock as using something as gimmicky. He's taking something that's completely different and new and saying, okay, I'm going to introduce killing off a major film star within 10 minutes. I'm also going to make birds terrifying. <laughs> I'm also going to make things that are normal terrifying or like Nightmare on Elm Street. My gosh, he made going to sleep terrifying. I mean, if you went to sleep, I'm that you're was... talking about Alfred. Not, uh, you know. I'm moving on. Okay. This is my, <laughs> my, it was a little roll. I'm like, you didn't dude, do nightmare. <laughs> my brain. This is how my brain works, people. We are very aware of that. And then, you know, all these different types of things. And then, of course, I don't know if it was gimmicky, but people kept running. I mean, uh, The Exorcist, my personal fave. Um, was terrifying people. I mean, they were giving out barf bags to people. Hmm. That's pretty gimmicky. Hmm. And people were terrified of that whole thing. And um, you haven't seen it, have you? Which, uh, Exorcist? Yeah. I saw a long time ago. My time my ago. my horror movies experiences came when I was probably like between the ages of like seven and ten because my dad, I watched whatever he watched. So, I mean, I was watching Poltergeist, Exorcist. I watched Damien, Poltergeist. That was a good movie. Those are good omens are good movies. Oh, my God. Poltergeist scared me. That's and why, my... I like, horror movies don't affect me. It's because I was such a young age. I was just like, mm. I was terrified. Still. I mean, I watched Poltergeist at a very young age, and then my older sister would sit there, and all at once her eyes would get big, and she'd act like the <laughs> clown. Thanks, Wendy. That was really... Uh, and then I watched uh, Nightmare on Elm Street and I was actually <laughs> um, at my dad's house and my sister was sleeping in a single bed and I said, can I sleep with you? And she said, that's fine, but don't touch me because... And so I'm like sleeping on the very edge of the bed. I'm completely terrified. And these things I watched very young. You must have been very... I don't know. I think it's because you're blocking it out. No. I'm, just, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They, I just, they just have no effect on me. And and before we roll into um, one of the movies uh, that we want to talk about a little bit more, I want to say like another piece of gimmicky, and it's more of a marketing gimmick thing that has been more of an annoyance to me year after year is going back into the Hollywood film vaults or yeah. the things of our youth and taking those movies and remaking them 20 to 30 years later and sometimes even a shorter realm. Right. Um, I think where I don't find it a gimmick is when they actually take something that was so bad and they actually make something good out of it. But that's l- probably less than 1% of the films that have ever come out. Everything else is just like, Cash oh, let's go Didn't make you... something that we Karate Kid. Made. Didn't you say they were remaking Clue? They're trying to. It's right now being rewritten. So, Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you with that. I can't. I can't stand that. And so I, I find that as a, a gimmick of Hollywood in general of like, Whatever let's regurgitate 
oh, stuff that was popular with this generation when they were young and bring it back. Speaking of psycho and gimmicky. And then we have Vince Vaughn, who they decide to do it frame shot by, by shot. frame. Yeah. Of what? Psycho. Sa- Psycho. He redid. He was. <laughs> uh, was that 1990, end of the 90s? Oh, okay. Yeah. They did it frame by frame. And it was How would not you want to act in a, good. Why would you want to be a puppet in a movie like that? That's kind of horrible. It was They good. wanted to do it as an experiment. Yeah. It, it, I think it bombed. And they did it in color, right? Yeah. It mm. was it, it was bad, but it was. I mean, you could practically you were supposed to be able to play them mm-hmm. right next to each other. Not good. Well, with that in mind, yes, let's move. Let's into talk our movie. about a scanner darkly. So, have you all seen it or heard about it? I've yes? seen it. Have you read the book, Ron? Saw the trailer. That's impressive. <laughs> so. Robert Downey's uh, one of his rebound. Yes, two thousand six. Poor guy, though. He rebounds into movies about drugs. Well, yeah. That's not good. But he didn't take any, so that was good. I it think was, it, was it was all in preparation for his his jaunt as Playboy Philanderfer millionaire guy yeah. for Iron Man. Now, was it... It was all getting him ready for that role. I think it was Scanner Darkly, then it was Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and then he went to Iron Man after yeah. that. So, and Kiss Kiss was a great movie. Anyway, Scanner Darkly. So, Scanner Darkly came out in 2006. It's an animated sci-fi film. And it also has, well, let me start. It was written and directed by Richard Linklater, who okay. adapted it from a Philip K. Dick novel. Uh, which it's is crazy. Always a good story writer. Um, Sorry. And the story is about an undercover cop in the not-too-distant future who is involved in a new drug situation, epidemic, and how he starts losing his own identity by taking the drug and surveilling his friends and whatnot. This film was actually unique in the way that it was made. It was shot digitally in Texas. And then the post-production team went in frame by frame and animated over all the footage. So if you haven't seen Scanner Darkly and you don't know exactly what we're talking about, you've most likely have seen the classic 80s video of, uh, I believe it's Take On Me. Uh Yeah, I think so. Um, It's the black and white. You know, it's very reminiscent of that, but more closer to a shaded cell animation. Um, that kind of took over things after this, around this time right. that this movie came out. So I, I think it works. The I mean, it's a gimmick, yes, but I think it works. I mean, Richard's always doing new things. He did 12 years, you know. So I think this, the scramble suit would not have worked if it were done live action. It would have been like a Green Lantern effect with Ryan Reynolds that we all don't want to talk about. So, um, yeah, so I think the animated feature made the scramble suit work. And the scramble suit, if you don't know the story, is giving the person wearing it different identities like they're never the same person there are different images different faces so this helps the undercover work in the film and also even in the opening title sequence uh rory cochran who let me just go through we have keanu reeves in the film we have robbie Downey jr we have woody helson winona writer and rory cochran who is from empire records in case you're that far back and you're youthful like me um but the opening scene has him paranoid and freaking out because there's aphids little bugs crawling all over him and again if this were live action we kind of CG little ugly pixels on his arm, but since it's animated, we get the aphids attacking him, him washing his hair, and they just keep appearing and appearing. Kind of like that prank people do where they put shampoo in your hair when you're washing your hair, and then you rinse it out, and then they put more in your hair. You don't realize it. And, and he it, does it with his dog. It's yeah. really sad. So, but the film's all about paranoia and creepiness, and Robbie Downey is creepy in this, and I enjoyed the film. I watched it. I have it on DVD, and it's a good laugh riot. Wow. And it's good seeing where Robbie Downey Jr. has come from his firing termination on Alec McBeal to rehab to this, Scanner Darkly, and then Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and then now he's in the Marvel Universe. Yeah, uh, the, basically himself. the cornerstone of the Marvel Universe yeah. now. So, it's, um, yeah, they talk about it being the civil war on the brain. You mean their brain splitting in hemispheres wise? Yeah. Yes. And they were just. Substance D. Uh, this was interesting because it was this uh, particular movie dealt with um, using it with uh, movement and light instead of just movement. Um, when you talk about rotoscoping, ro- rotoscoping, rotoscoping, so a lot of it had to do with movement. But this one was movement and light, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, they call the technique uh, interpoloid rotoscoping. In yeah. case anyone out there wants to know what this called. Like really nerds out there. It actually won a Hugo Award. It did. Which is a set of literary awards um, that are annually given 
for the best science fiction or fantasy works achievement of the previous year. So that's pretty good. It is. Um, I thought it was... It's interesting to watch. It's somewhat hard to watch. I mean, it's hard to watch, meaning like uh, the drug sequences and, and the bugs and, and, you know, and like suffering so much, these people and and how they go in and out of um, their person, like who they are. Right. Uh, it's, uh, what was the drug? I have it written down. Substance D. Substance D. I don't know if it was based on anything. The move the the book was actually published in seventy seven. So they have it in Orange County in the then future, which is like nineteen ninety four, even though it came out in two thousand six, which I think I thought was kind of funny. But um he did pretty well. I mean budgeted yes. six million. Very low budget film. So shot in Panasonic H no not, there's not H sorry, P uh, they're the predecessor to the HVX, which is a prosumer camera recorder. I use one, but there's actually the SD version of it, which DVX shot that all that way. There was a whole trend back then too. People were getting these Canon XL ones. People had all mm-hmm. the red Canon camera camcorders. So people were used. That's the. I think this film was the kind of the start, not the start, but the like. People realized they can take their own cameras, buy their own video cameras, and shoot their own movies and do things with them. It's kind of like the Clerks version because Clerks. Kevin right. Smith used 16 millimeter and went over budget and maxed out credit cards and debt just to make clerks. And it turned out well. So risks makes opportunities work and flourish. Yeah. And, you know, you get, like you mentioned the Canon XL one, I think I was looking at that like 2003, 2004, and it was really just like, yeah, put on a full on production video camera in your hand. And you've now opened up the door to all these different directors to do different stuff. Right. And you don't need these big expensive film cameras, and all this is really expensive film. You just need a couple uh, lights, uh, DV, mini tapes, mini tapes, and uh, go at it. Well, the thing is, the I have you know access to film cameras and whatnot. It's not the film cameras are expensive, not even the film. The film is kind of cheap. It's the processing is that's so expensive. It's that per foot, you know, you have to spend money on, and that's what always deterred me from filming on film long term. Is like. Sending that stuff away and getting it on a mini DV tape, and then editing it on that, and then sending it back. And go ahead. And speaking of that, one thing I didn't mention during talking about Kodachrome is actually it was filmed on thirty-five millimeter. Nice. And oh. they, they make it very prominent at the end that says this was filmed on thirty-five millimeter Kodak. Film. Did they say at the end? They but didn't say it. It was on. It was big text right at the. Okay. All right. This after the credits. This one talks about um, the end credits which featured an abridged version of the afterward of the book in which Dick lists the people he knew who have suffered serious right. and permanent physical or mental brain damage, psychosis, um, pancreatic trauma, or death as a result of the drug use. And he lists his own name. Well, yeah, he was pretty heavy in that stuff back then. People say that kind of influences writing. Oh, um, this is interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it was just that Linklater added... Another name to the credit and dedicated to the memory of um, Louis H. Mackey, who was the influential philosophy professor that had appeared in two of his previous films. Mm. I just thought that was kind of odd to put right at the end, but that's okay. I think that that's fascinating. I mean, I think it's good to put that at the end saying, yeah, look at this cool movie, but this is... Well, I mean, I always knew watching it that this was based on something. And reading Philip's novels, you can tell that he's heavily under the influence of something. Oh, my gosh. Um, and I think that Substance D was a reference to um, LSD and things like that because that's the only drug I know of that does split you in that way. I mean, acid does, but not in that way. I don't have firsthand experience in this, like, by the way. Really? I don't have firsthand experience. Tell us I, more. I'm just a, talk about this? I'm just a writer who does a lot of research, and when I research <laughs> things, I become an intermediate expert on things. Yeah, all so. you have to do is watch this man um, so. So. on YouTube. His so. yeah, some some of his. Uh, You're talking about Philokate Dick, or, yeah? Okay, his uh, interviews. Yeah, he's got yeah. some stuff going on there. Messes with your brain. It's kind of lesser bangs in his prime too, but lesser bangs wasn't that bad. Sorry. Anything more on? Uh, I think it's a good mix in Scanner Darkly. I think Scanner Darkly should be watched. I think it should be watched. Part. I mean, I, especially if you're a film nerd. 
I mean, a film. It's a piece of art that definitely sticks out in the rest of the art that's well, out there. Let's flash forward to this past year. The Love Vincent film was oil painted. So yeah. they made a whole film with oil painting. I, so did, I haven't seen that yet. I haven't seen it yet either. Is that the one uh, Vince Van Gogh? Yes. Yeah. So looks, I'll be seeing that. It it looks beautiful. But the fa- watching the documentary and how they make that film. They farmed out <sighs> a lot of people to help. So, But it's a good story. And I think Scanner Directly should be watched. And you may not enjoy it, but you can still learn things from it. Yeah. And it's Robbie Downing on his comeback. So that's always a bonus for me. Yeah. And Winona Ryder. Like before she, she was coming back and then she left and then she came back again later. So, you know. Ebbs and flows of Hollywood. It's a nice little historical piece. Awesome. Uh, our next show, uh, Topic and Valerie. Valerie, what's your topic? Well, since we are moving into the summer season, well, sort of, we're spring, but it's becoming earlier here. Um, I was kind of interested in blockbusters. Um, what makes a good blockbuster? But I also feel like what makes a good blockbuster to different types of people, different people, what make you, you, me. Um, and how they sell them, how they pitch them, and when they start coming out. You said you mentioned earlier they keep coming out earlier and earlier. Yeah. And uh, so I think we'll be talking about some of the blockbusters that are coming out that maybe we're excited about, maybe we're not excited about, maybe some that use gimmicks. Um, so that's kind of what I was thinking about talking about next time. Fun, fun, fun. <laughs> Anybody got anything in our grab bag? No, not really. What's uh, on your uh, cue for this week, Valerie? Well, now um, I'm going to watch Kodachrome. Um, <laughs> and then I uh, totally forgot because I've been a little preoccupied. preoccupied. Um, the Handmaid's Tale has been on Hulu and I have five episodes. Season two. Yeah. yeah. Season two, I have five, episo- five episodes to watch. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and then again... Buffy the Vampire Slayer whoop, whoop. is going to be, if You're I welcome. am awake and coherent, I will start watching that. You're welcome. If you, I, start, I, if you start falling asleep, put it on pause and then put something I else that you want to sleep through. <laughs> yeah, like, never mind. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm really excited about it. I'm excited about Handmaid's Tale. I don't know about Buffy. And I'm excited about Go to Chrome, even though you said not to watch I, it. I, yeah. I mean, I, I'd put it at uh, barely above a passing grade as a film overall. But we both have different views on movies. We do. Yeah, but. We do. You'll quality's see. quality. The, okay, that's not true. That <laughs> is such crap. She'll find out. <laughs> have you seen it? No. Okay. But it's like Match Point with Ed Harris, not Ed, with uh, Patrick Stewart in it. So I was really underwhelmed. I read Match the play. Point with Patrick Stewart. Yeah, it was based on a play. But Craig Lucas wrote it, I think. Oh, I'm thinking Match Point by Woody. Mm -mm. We'll talk about it later. No needs to go into that right now. (laughs) Sorry, Woody meaning Woody. So you got Buffy, you've got Handsmaid's Tale, Coda Chrome. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Tony? I have nothing, actually. Nothing? I mean, my cue's there, but I still, I'm just going to. Any movies you're going to go see? Could you go see a movie for me and let me know? (laughs) What is it? I, uh, can you bring your camera in? And- could you slightly? <laughs> could you? Because I really uh, want to see Mary Shelley. Well, Grace would probably see that with you if you hook up with her and say, "Hey, well, I well, can't." It's going to be a little harder the next couple. It'll of weeks. be in theaters. Only. It'll be at Dollar Theater when you, you're ready. You guys can see it together. It'll be. I really want to see Mary Shelley. Is it called Mary Shelley? Mary Shelley. Yes. I'm sorry. I, and- it reminds me of Mary Riley. <laughs> Anyway, I don't think I've even like that's heard of right, this movie. That's a Julia Roberts we'll figure it movie. Out. Anyway, Mary Shelley, uh, obviously the author of Frankenstein. Have you watched Frankenstein Chronicles yet? No, I tried, dude. Did you? It Grace was really gruesome to. for me. Yeah, I told you. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> oh well, I'm watching Timeless. The finale is Sunday night. Timeless. The finale is already. Wow. Yes. So I'm excited. It's two hours. Oh, on my queue is my DVR queue. I forgot about that. So I have all these shows that I haven't watched. Like, uh, well, they're guilty pleasures. I'm gonna say, you know, I'll have them. Like, uh, um, how to get away with murder. Mm. Sorry, and uh, I, I hate to admit this. I really do. 
But I still DVR Grey's Anatomy, and I don't know why. Mm. Because all I do is sit there and think, this guy's not as good as Derek. Why why watch it? The question is, why is he still on TV? I okay. don't know. But anyway. Um, and then I have something else on there that I was going to watch, but I can't remember. So obviously it's not that important. What about you, Ron? I am excited to go and see Deadpool 2 this weekend. So um, that's my that's my big one. Um, everything else is kind of whatever can fit in. I still got to finish up Lost in Space. I have three episodes of Lost in Space. This weekend or next weekend? Deadpool. This Deadpool weekend. starts out. Okay, so it's... Yeah, it's this weekend. Cool. The this Infinity War moved up two weeks. It was supposed to come out this weekend originally. Oh. And so that would have been the kickoff of blockbuster season. Oh. The last two weeks, there's been absolutely nothing in theaters. Nothing. And vendors just gave themselves two extra weeks to just and soak up money. That's why I said I turned to Mandy and I said, I don't know if I should apologize or what, but there was nothing else in the theater. She said there had to be something They else. did it on purpose. They, they were like, we nothing. can make money and they took it. So once Deadpool 2 comes out, then it continues the, like every week there's something for almost every week of summer. The preview out. is absolutely obnoxious. Deadpool 2? Yes. Yeah, of course the point. Is. That's his whole personality. Ugh. I don't know if I can do it. You gotta watch the first one and love it and then watch the second one. So yeah, that, uh, Lost in Space, I gotta finish up. Um, what else we got here? Westworld is on. Is so that that's kind of Westworld? I love Westworld. Have you seen it? No. Okay. Is Jeffrey Wright in it? Yes. Then I need to watch it because <laughs> Jeffrey's good. I'm trying to remember if that's the right name I'm thinking Jeff's of. Jeff's in Casino Royale. He plays Felix, and he's also, yeah, he's the CIA agent in James Bond with um, Daniel Craig. I'm just going to say yes, because I don't have a shop. search real quick. I can't okay. even think of his face. Uh, what else is, yeah, Timeless is is there. That's been a weekly weekly watch so, thing. I mean, I like history, so it just... I got to get this timeless thing I think they, they, do, they do the conflict well yeah. between like the inner conflict as to what they're struggling with and the like the, you know, the events of them changing time. Is this and, Quantum Leap basically? Yes. Okay. I said that. But like how like Sorry. they understand that no matter what they do, it time is going to be affected. It's how much is time going to be affected. Right. And Is he looking at uh, a picture of himself and seeing his, you know, whether his sister is disappearing or if he's coming back? Okay, just checking. No, but you've had a character where, like, the 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 main actress, her sister disappeared from the timeline. And then you have the other one of the main characters where his wife was been dead for five years all of a sudden. Boom, up. she's back in the so timeline. If, she had a po- if but there was now a there's Polaroid, like this, this would be happening. There's now this like complete sub there's like a, there's plot a, of like, oh, where has she actually been, been for the past five and years? And Timeless is on, I'm sorry, what? NBC. Yeah, oh, NBC. I have not been taping it. Is it on Hulu, you think? No. Mm, they just brought it back. No. They canceled it. And okay, so I won't and be watching Timeless forever. until I don't DVD. know when that happens. So, so yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff like, you know, I got to catch up on Billions. I'm just kind of, most of the time I just let everything just condense into like okay the season's done now i'm just gonna blast through it so that's kind of where i am with billions i've got to go walk to bosh mm. um but outside of deadpool that's can probably be the main one that i'll see this week coming up i'm not excited about lost world well, not lost world but you know what i mean the new jurassic, jurassic world. world i'll yeah, see man. it because i'm a yeah freak yeah. for dinosaurs but other than that it's like mm, we'll see how i feel not can sure. my kids corner be old can we can we a blast from the past you mean like Super Fudge by Judy Bloom? Yeah. That not. <laughs> um, the Secret World of Arietti, which is a Ghibli film. Studio Ghibli. Mm-hmm. Nope. Doesn't he have a new one coming out? Ryan? They do have a new That's one coming thought. out. But Studio have, Ghibli, uh, um, you know, they did the Oscar winning film. Spirit Away. Uh, Spirited Away, which was terrifying. <laughs> Was it was terrifying. Zoe and I had to leave. Harper, who was mm, four at the time, was transfixed. And Zoe and I were like, ah, we're out of here. There's a lot of parents I see these days taking their kids to animation, and they think that all cartoons are children-friendly. I'm, I'm hoping that at some point we can... S- are you saying that... Not you. I'm just saying parents. Oh, you're not you. Oh, it's a cartoon. They can watch it. I'm like, that's not always true. No, it's not true. I mean, Spirited Away is terrifying, but... Harper seemed to not be affected. But Secret World of Arietti 
not terrifying. And in fact, it's kind of, it is based on, um, I want to say the Littles, but it's not. The Littles was the TV show. It's The Borrowers. Right. The Borrowers was the book. So it's it's really charming and wonderful. I like David DeNome. There awesome. You go. Anything else for we sign off here? I'm all good. I'm good. Cool. Anthony, where can we find you? I'm on Facebook and on Twitter at S M T O R C H I O. Valerie? <laughs> I'm kind of on um <laughs> I feel like I'm still on Twitter on, but I don't. You're do Twitter. on Twitter. You haven't tweeted in 460 days from yeah, Penny Lane so 64. Really not. Tweet. I tagged you. You should kind of tweet now. Okay, I'll try to tweet. You uh, did tweet from V Vidmar though. I know. I don't understand. I got to get that figured <laughs> out, people. I will have some time. And then Instagram, um, Penny Lane 64, and then um, I don't know. I might be signing off from Facebook. I haven't decided. Yeah, but she's going to be on a little break here. Um, We'll get her back on I'm at remote. Signing, signing, signing off. Signing, signing off. From Facebook. Yeesh. Uh, oh. <laughs> but I haven't decided yet. So, um, you know, I'm always, you know, you can always probably give me some type of message on uh, culturalstew.net, right? Yeah. You can uh, message us over on culturalstew.net uh, over on Facebook. So you can find me. Pretty much everywhere at GF Media or GF Media CEO. You can find us at culturalstew.net. Can we at find Cultural Stew Net on Twitter and Cultural Stew on Facebook. And if you've been a listener and or this is your first one, please head over to Apple iTunes, leave us a review, head on over to our Facebook page, spark up a conversation. We want to talk. We know you're listening. I see the numbers. Tell us what we're doing wrong. Tell us what we're yeah. doing right. I like the right ones. Good or bad. We just want feedback. Right. Who you don't like, who you like the most. Um, just kidding. None of this undercover feedback where you <laughs> only email Valerie and don't say anything else. <laughs> just kidding. Um, where can we find, um, I know you don't want to talk about this, but I am just going to say, where can we find your films? My films? Yeah. Uh, Vimeo.com slash GF Media. Okay. I or recommend Or GF Media CEO on YouTube. Like there I said, go. GF Media at pretty much ever. GF Media CEO. I whatever. know, but I don't think they know you have films out there, and I think people should be watching your I films. I said that the last show. I'm promoting again. He's <laughs> plugging you up. I'm, I am. Plug, plug. Ah, they are what they are. They're not perfect. But hey. <sighs> Who is? Come, join us. This was great. Be part of the cultural stew. Be part of the conversation. Thank you very much. Catch Our you listening next time. audience. Wow. The intro and break music is Please Listen Carefully by Jazir, available through the Creative Commons license from Free Music Archive. The outgoing music is provided by Epidemic Sound. Please see our show notes for details on what the outgoing song is and who it is by. And also, as always, if you have a piece of music that you'd like us to play or consider playing, please contact us today.
Like what you've heard? Want to continue to hear more? Please consider Patreon. What is Patreon, you ask? Patreon is a content creator support site, a way for people to support the things they love and allow creators to continue creating the content that they love. Please consider heading over to patreon.com slash gfmedia and becoming a Patreon supporter today.